we're limited on staff, we're limited on time, we're limited with, with cash, we have tremendous limitations. So what do we do? We do the best we can. We create partnerships with others, we extend our hands and, and friendship and also helping with financial things to, you know, to, to benefit our, our, our parks the best we can. So we're making do with less, but there comes a time when, when, when people, and I'm a politician, I served in the legislature, you always hear the term, oh, we have to, I see Dennis Conta back there, who's also served in the legislature. He knows, and we all know, as elected officials, oh, we can trim the fat. Oh, trim the fat. Well, guess what? As a doctor, I know that it's not just fat we're trimming. We've cut muscle, we've cut tendon, and we're into bone. We've cut organs, and we're hurting badly. But at the same time, we're standing upright, you know, we're still doing the best we can. We're, we're making sure our bathrooms are clean. One of the big things when we had COVID, we're shutting everything down. I heard about porta potties. I have heard very loud from not only my own wife, but from, from families and mothers. Their children don't want to go into porta potties. We need to have facilities open. We have to have those open. Guys have heard it over and over, and then we heard it. So we got that open, but when those facilities are open, something else doesn't open. So we have problems, we have financial challenges, we have staff challenges. Um, you're gonna hear more about that. I wanna be positive. We're in a church today. Church is supposed to be positive. Um, but at the same time, I also wanna have reality exposed to you. So at this point, I wanna, I don't wanna keep monopolizing the time uh, uh, for, for Guy and myself. So I don't wanna take all this time. Um, I'm very, very honored to have Guy Smith come up here as the executive director of the park system. When he got nominated, I was asked by the county executive, what do you think of this nomination? I said, thumbs up. I've worked with Guy for a while uh, and uh, it's a pleasure working with him. And we recently, we can talk about this later if you want to, we went through the domes on a dome store, which is another huge problem. And if anybody wants to talk about domes, we can talk about domes. That's a major issue for Milwaukee, facing all of us as Milwaukee County residents. Uh, but it's been a pleasure. So when the county executive asked me about Guy Smith, my thumbs went up. And when he had a confirmation vote, it was a no-brainer. I supported Guy Smith on, on, his, on his position, and I'll continue supporting him in the future. So with that, Guy, love to have you on. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to start out by saying that what a beautiful church I've ever been in here. Before I did um, actually live on the east side for quite a while. And this is this is gorgeous. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your morning today to be with us. Um, thank you, Supervisor Wasserman, for your leadership of Parks Committee and the County Board. It is definitely a challenge. I'll start out by saying parks in the outdoors have always been my passion. I've been with Milwaukee County Parks for over 18 years. I uh, started as a trails coordinator and worked my way up. Um, I'm in my second uh, four-year term with parks director, and, and I love it, uh, but it is a challenge. But when I came here, <clears throat> I knew that it was going to be a challenge. Um, fiscally, we have a lot of issues. I will tell you that our staff is extremely passionate. I also know um, certain partners in the room with the park people, and I worked with Bruce at Groundwork. <clears throat> we also have the Milwaukee Parks Foundation. Um, which is helping us raise funds to be able to do some of the things we haven't been able to do in our budget. Um, as the county supervisor pointed out, we do have a glimmer of hope uh, in this year's budget with approximately $1.5 million in additional funds than we had previously. Uh, I made it a goal of mine this year that we were going to add full-time staff to our, to our ranks. So we actually have 17 full-time staff uh, that will be created in this new budget. Um, in the 1980s, we had 1,300 full-time equivalent. Currently, I have only 250 full-time staff. Um, when, when we're at full staff, quote unquote, with seasonal staff, we'd have about 900. Um, probably not surprising to anyone in this room, we had a real difficulty this year uh, bringing on staff because it is so competitive out there. So we tried to pay more, tried to retain folks, but it was a challenge. But I will tell you, it was pretty amazing. Um, the first time in two and a half years, being able to have special events, the majority of our facilities open, it felt about as normal as normal could feel um, in, this, in this day and age. Uh, as Bruce had mentioned earlier, uh, we did work, uh, the Parks Department 
um, and many stakeholders worked with the Wisconsin Policy Forum with Rob Henkin um, on the Sinking Treasure Report. And the reason that we commissioned that study was uh, when COVID hit in 2020, um, I was not able to hire any full-time staff of that 900 seasonal staff that I mentioned. We only were able to bring on 185. We were looking at a $10 million deficit projection just because it was COVID. So I literally had over 90 non-field operation staff working at least one to two shifts a week in the field. So landscape architects, accountants, mowing grass, doing litter, because we didn't want to lay anyone off. We wanted to make sure that we kept our system open as best we could. There were segments of the Oak Leaf Trail, because we have trail counters that went up 160% in use in uh, March and April of, of the pandemic. And it's continued to grow, which is amazing, but that just shows that parks are so important to our quality of life, both our mental health and physical health. So when the county executive, David Crawley came into office and Mary Jo was chief of staff, one of the first things I told them is I said, the bubble gum, the duct tape and the string isn't holding our system together. And it's being shown and laid bare by the pandemic and how short staff and everything we were. I said, can we, can we look at sustainable funding models to put everything on the table? And they were like, absolutely. So uh, with that, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, uh, the chairwoman, county exec, a bunch of other stakeholders were all part of that, including the Park People and Parks Foundation. And so we looked at about 12 different options, everything from separate park districts to enhance partnerships with MMSD, uh, deeper partnerships with school districts or municipalities, all these different options. Um, and so that report came out in the end of 2021. We've had a lot of uh, meetings, uh, community forums, things such as this. Uh, later this month, we'll actually be uh, meeting with the uh, original stakeholder group, and we'll narrow down probably two to three options that Rob Henkin and his team are really going to put pen to paper, look at the logistics and the dollars and cents to see what we can do for sustainable funding. The reason that's important is so I mentioned we have the, you know, the positive glimmer of hope on some of the operating budget in increases. We have been successful in getting ARPA uh, recovery funds for capital projects as well as some capital funding. So that's awesome. But that's this year. And as we get into 2027 and beyond, that's where we're looking at some real challenges for funding. Because the issue is that Milwaukee County Parks, the transit system, for example, those are not mandated services. So those are not required to exist by the state. Health and Human Services, the Sheriff's Office, all these other things, those are required. So the tax levy will go towards that. When it comes to cost recovery, uh, Milwaukee County Parks uh, makes at least 55% revenue to go into our, our operating budget. Normally, across the nation, 25%. So we do a great job on one hand where we're bringing in revenue to sustain ourselves, but it's kind of juxtaposed because it means I've got my golf, I've got my food beverage, I've got the McKinley Marina bringing in money, which is awesome. But I also need to provide playgrounds. I need to provide trails. I need to provide open space because we want to be an equitable park system. We want to provide that option for everyone. So it is a challenge, but the positive news is that people such as yourselves want to be involved. And so what I would suggest is because, for example, the county executive gave his budget address to the county board this past Thursday. Now we're in budget deliberation. So this is when the public really should be involved. And the county supervisors are doing their public town halls, which my team and I participate in. But this is the time to help shape the budget, which will be finalized in mid-November. Um, and so then you're able to show you know, what your values are, what you want to see as citizens, what, what we can provide to the public, because we have an amazing system. The folks that build this system, is it's just mind boggling because we have this great lake, we have these rivers, we have all this land, and a lot of cities and communities are playing catch up. They're trying to like acquire this and acquire that. And we have this beautiful asset, we have these wonderful partners, and we're here to steward it. So I just call to action is, if you're not, get involved with the friends group. 
get involved with the Milwaukee Parks Foundation. Be part of the, the political process. And just, we are always looking for partners. Throwing out some more positivity out there. Twice this week, I was at American Family Field because on Thursday, Christian Yelich, uh, the Milwaukee Brewers, and Nike donated over $92,000, which will be going into Beckham and Carver Parks to support the Beckham Staples in Little League, which is awesome. Last night, I was at American Family. Um, U.S. Cellular donated $30,000 um, for no, new scoreboards and some more parks. So there's some really cool stuff going on, um, and we need to highlight that. We don't always want to talk about potentially the negative or the difficult things, but part of it is just educating folks, the challenges that we have, and then what are ways that we can get involved. So with that, thank you. And we certainly can take questions or if there's certain topics you want to talk about, um, Bruce, you're the leader. You let us know what you want to do. But thank you so much for having us and for your support uh, and for what you do for the community. Thank you both for your leadership, Bob. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, I want to start out with a question and then we'll open it up. Um, do we have an ability to take questions from people who are online? I don't see anybody at the oh. computer right now. Okay, this, this time around, we're not going to do that. So think about questions. Both of you mentioned having more money in the budget. But as I understand it, this is a budget proposal. It's not really money in the budget yet. It was just what County Executive Crowley proposed in his budget, uh, as you mentioned, Guy, uh, in his budget address on Thursday. So it's not really a budget uh, uh, in, um, improvement at this point, uh, is it? Um, I, I see you both nodding. So I think that's that's correct. But Mr. Wasserman, if you could uh, talk a little bit about how uh, the county board will be looking at a budget request like this in light of there's a cut to transit that was proposed in that, which is a huge need. We've got these state mandates, which Guy mentioned, there's public safety issues, um, mental health issues. Um, how, does, how does the county board and you as an elected official look at these competing demands and what does that mean for our park system? Thanks for the question, Bruce. Um, what's going to happen now, first of all, we do have the first step done. You know, getting it in the budget before it even gets to the uh, finance committee is a key thing. I mean, it's a major step forward. It's not as much money as I want, but it's something. And, you know, a million dollars is nothing to sneeze about. So we have, we're moving forward with that. But what we need to do is we need to keep it in that budget, let alone if we could add to it, which are doubtful. Um, but at the same time, if we could, we, we need to keep it. To keep it, finance now deals with it. Finance committee is made up of seven members. The entire board is 18 member board. So seven members, Liz Sumner, who's uh, our supervisor north of, uh, of us, starting in Sherwood with the redistricting up to uh, Bayside and River Hills and a bit of Brown River and Glendale, she has. Um, including Whitefish Bay, Fox Point Base, I can cover all the communities, um, is the chair of the finance committee. Uh, she is going to be having a series of hearings. First of all, there's open hearings listening to the budget in another week and a half. Then she's got hearings about the budget. They're taking amendments, and then the finance committee is going to have to uh, vote on it. Then it goes before the full board. So what you could do is, if you live, if you live in my district, I'm 100% on board. You know, I, I if you want to contact me, you can. Um, actually, my legislative aide, who I want to point out in the back of the room here, his hands waving, that's Clarence Kennard. He is my aide. Uh, our office is your office. I really mean that. And you can always contact Clarence to get messages to me. You can call my home directly. You can send a phone, phone book. We even have phone books now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a landline uh, that's open. But, anyways, you can always contact me and express, you know, support the parks. But uh, for the other communities, contacting Liz Sumner, contacting other members of the finance committee, and contacting basically your supervisor is the key thing. Supervisors listen to people who live in their districts. 
Because every politician knows who your boss, who their boss is. If you don't have your constituents vote for you, you lose your job. So you want to keep your constituents happy. So contact them, tell them that you support the park system, you support the budget, and uh, it's key. So that's the key thing. I also think it's important if you know uh, the county executive, David Crowley, thanks for putting in there, giving a quick thanks. You know, we, we appreciate it. You want more money in the future, but at the same time, you support what we have. So I think the county executive needs to hear that too. So that's going to help be the whole problem, the whole process of what's going to take place. That's your best contact sources. There'll be a public hearing November 1st, but I think really directly to your individual supervisors is the key thing, saying here, this is your priority. We support that. And I think that's how you get things done. Thank you. I'll uh, take questions and I'll repeat the question um, as we go forward. I think Mine is not a question. I want to tell you both. I walk from Bradford Beach to Discovery World three times a week with the dog who is a scavenger. And your staff this summer with all those events that have come back, it has been brilliant how they have cleaned that entire area. It, it is absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. We got a compliment. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Other questions? Um, yes. What's the best way to kind of keep tabs on when that big party is going to be with the bridge? I mean, is there, um, is there a site that we should go to kind of look for that? Is there any kind of announcements that we might be able to look out for in order to be part of that celebration? Question about the opening of the uh, Lake Park Bridge. Lake, <coughs> Lake Park Bridge. I'm, I don't mean to speak on behalf of Guy Smith, but uh, we are going to be putting it on our website the day we find out that, actually, we haven't even determined the date. I mean, I, so we don't know the date. I have to work with, I'm going to get a phone call from Guy. Here are the dates that we look like. And she has, there's a lot of logistics into like what that official date will be. But as soon as that date comes out, we're going to be putting it on our website. I'm sure, you're going to be putting it on the website. We're going to send out emails on it. I'll send out emails to every one of my constituents. Um, Yes. Website is, is um, it's Milwaukee County Supervisors or uh, andcountyparks.com. And we'll also be working with the Lake Park Friends um, okay. on it as well. So they'll put it on their website as well. Okay. And we'll do we'll do press releases um, between Parks Department, I'm sure with Supervisor Wasserman and his office as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> here, here, and here. Well, you know, I guess I'm, I'm hearing that, but I guess for the average citizen to get involved with that park situation is either go through the friends of the park, like Lake Park, or the foundation. Is that foundation an open? Is that a closed society? Is it an open society? Can anybody participate? Parks Foundation is a new group, uh, but Guy, tell us. Yeah, that. absolutely. Thank you. Very good question. So we started the parks foundation in november of 2019 and uh, we had some amazing um, uh, donors that uh, kicked things off with us we then uh, proceeded on uh, in 2020 on our strategic plan which is very much aligned with milwaukee county milwaukee county uh, is it's a twofold racial equity and becoming the healthiest county very much fits in with racial equity uh, with the Parks Foundation and being able to invest, especially in our parks and communities that have been divested. We then, a little over a year ago, hired our first um, executive director, uh, Rebecca Stoner, who I believe is going to be one of the speakers um, coming up, um, along with uh, Barry from the, the park people. And then she was able to build out her team about three months ago, and they brought on Tristan Shorter, who's their director of communications, and then uh, Adam Carr, who's the director of strategic partnerships, and anyone can be a member of the foundation. Um, I serve as the ex officio uh, director, and um, the major role is for myself and my leadership team to develop the priorities of funding needs that we that we would go to the foundation. So, just an example of a few projects. Uh, we're working with the Bucks and Collectivo. The work has already started on redoing uh, several basketball courts throughout the community. Uh, we're working on 
um, safety and lighting and some other things in key parks like Sherman Park and others. Uh, but anyone can get involved. So I would say twofold. I would get involved with the friends group that you, you know, have the most affinity or is in your neighborhood. But I would also um, get involved with the Parks Foundation because it is about funding, but it's also about awareness and advocacy. So does, does that help answer your question? Yeah, right. So um, that's basically what I understood. That's what I was the impression I would like to go. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We'll hear we'll hear more from the Parks Foundation staff that Guy mentioned. I think it's October 30th is when we have the uh, Parks Foundation uh, and park people coming to talk about more details. Fellas have a question. I have a question for Sheldon Wasserman, and that is, will the bridge, which for all of us, delighted its being completed, but will the Bean Road, or what my family calls Snake Road, be open again? Question about, uh, further question about Snake Road, as it to be called, and the roadway along with the bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about having this park, uh, having the bridge being worked on, is we didn't have to deal with the road question. Uh, I'd be very honest with you, maybe I'm being too blunt. Uh, this road, the road question has really been a dividing issue. And for for my district, really for, uh, for everybody who knows Lake Park. And it's been very divisive. Uh, mm -hmm. People feel very passionate about it. I mean, I think the passion to, we all were reunited on getting the road, getting the bridge done. But this road has been something else. And I can give you a very political answer. I can be real smooth about it. I'm being really honest with you. Uh, it's been very divisive. And it, you know, one thing uh, as an elected official, I want everybody to support. Things I want, I like, I work with government, I, I work with consensus. You know, you see a lot of politicians who, you know, my way or the highway or divide and conquer. I'm not one of those people. I think that we, you know, I'm more of a moderate. I, I like working with everybody. I want all sides to be involved in the decision making. I want everybody to be, you know, to be, I think we, I think you have to take the good, you have to take the good and the bad with everybody. Nobody gets their way in everything in life. And I think the best way in government is to work with everybody and to get things done well. The problem with the, the road is that we really have people with clear cut, we want this or we want that. Now, I think at the end of the day, there has been a lot of damage that road. Let's be practical, there's been a lot of damage that road. We don't know what that road costs to redo it as, as it is right now. We also know it doesn't fit codes and like, they can't really build roads with that, with that narrow. And so we have coding issues. We have, we have significant number of problems with what we have because we don't know what we have. So we're gonna to have to actually assess what that road is, what the cost to restore it. We have to be practical at the end of the day. What is it gonna cost? Now, we also have to look at the cost for hybrid now. You know, Lake Park Friends have taken a view that we should not go completely pedestrian, let's go hybrid. Well, how much is that gonna cost? And also how much is the pedestrian gonna cost? Uh, a bike pathway or just a walkway? We have to deal with the grade and who can walk it. But I think right now, the truth is, the first step in this whole process is the finances. What will it cost to restore it in each one of these three capacities? Hybrid, road, or a bike and pedestrian type of pathway. And when we get those results, let's see what those numbers are. Then we're gonna have to sit down and talk. I think the what I, I wanna have is I definitely will have open community meetings on this thing. We're gonna to have to listen to everybody. We're not gonna have a, I'm not gonna make the decision. We're not gonna let Lake, Lake Park Friends are a great group and we support them, but they're one group. And we have to talk to all groups. We have to have everybody involved. Uh, membership in one organization is not gonna make the determination, but everyone's gonna be involved. We're gonna have open hearings on it. We're gonna discuss this and we're gonna to try to come up with what's best for the community in something that's most cost effective way. So that's how it's going to happen at the end of the day. But when, I don't know, it's going to be, it's on customers' radar, law and clear too. He knows what's out there. Uh, but we also, we, I, I really I looked at this road. I walked from, I uh, walked outside, I actually had like, an inspection. That road's in terrible shape. I mean, there's huge cranes working on it. How much structural damage has been done to it? Don't know. So 
that's kind of like the how we're going to lay it out. Long-winded answer, uh, but I think it's important to know where I'm coming from and where what I'm thinking about. But I want everybody involved in that decision making, and let's get some data and facts in front of us before we we jump on anything. So it's mostly a cost issue in terms of the business. It's, it's it's no, it's not just cost. It's there. There is there are people who who've grown up on that road and has different terms and you know that it means a lot to them. I mean, and we're also I'm very sympathetic. I mean, in the fall when the leaves are changing, you know, going on that road is one of the most beautiful times. I, I you know we all remember anybody who's been in Milwaukee remember it's now been close for seven years. Uh, about seven years it's been close, but you know it has specific memories and you know and and we can't discount that. You know, it means something. And it's, it's just, you know, nostalgia and it's just, you know, memories of our past. And as taxpayers, we want something that makes us feel good. And taking that walk or, or that, you know, <clears throat> riding along that path, especially if a convertible, you see you know, <laughs> pictures of people in old convertibles, even before muscle cars, you know, old convertibles, just riding. And I heard stories about, you know, children with their grandparents and cars. So it's more than just money. It's 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 really about families and memories and more. Okay, we we've talked a bit about Lake Park here. Lake Park uh, was the walk that we did last month. Our Earth Justice Ministry, our environmental group, uh, sponsors walks every month to get people together, get out in nature in our parks. Last month was Lake Park. And next month, this month, actually, on October 15th, we'll be visiting Three Bridges Park. We'll be meeting at the Urban Ecology Center, Menominee Valley. There's information uh, down on the social justice table and in the chat clear. So uh, 10 a.m. October 15th, Three Bridges Park, if you want to take about. We actually call it our walk and roll, so, so people uh, in wheelchairs, uh, or your segue if you want to can, can join us. Let me see. Can I just, yeah, one more thing. Yeah. Just a plug for from the forum. Um, the uh, there are two more uh, forums coming up this month with the topic of parks and such in Milwaukee. And I just so you can mark it down and before you have to leave for the eleven o'clock service. The one is on the twenty third, and that's challenges Milwaukee County Parks. Bob Hankin, and he's going to be talking about the report for the Wisconsin Policy Forum on the sinking treasure of Milwaukee Parks. That's the 23rd. And then on the 30th, that will be the Milwaukee County Neighborhood Step Up Can the Efforts of Citizens Save Our Parks? And that will be Barry Waddell of Park People and Adam Parr, Strategic Park Partnerships with the Milwaukee Parks Foundation. So you can learn more about all those, a little more depth than some of the questions you're asking today. So the 23rd and the 30th. Can either of you stay a little past 11 if people want? To? Sure. Okay, some people will need to go to the 11 o'clock service soon, uh, but we can stay a little bit longer. Ken, did you have something? And then I saw Dan's hand. Yeah, my, my question is for Guy, I guess. Um, so you, you know I'm involved with the flight equity part of the sporting car for a long time. What's the biggest first, um, need you see for uh, tasks that authors could do, but it's not being done? This is a side comment. One of the problems I see, and I'm part of the board of the park people, so we're the umbrella of the principles, is that people really are just focused a lot on where they want to go. No, no offense. But that's for people out of experience. But they don't get to see the whole the park system as a whole. And sometimes a, a, an asset can be saved is left to, to go while a hopeless guy work for with folks on a guy to scratch from yesterday. Um, or not hopeless or a friend's group. But meanwhile, there is that are very valuable that have a lot of are left to go because it's too remote. But anyway, so what is the main thing you see? Uh, that could be done from volunteers that are not in that. Sure. What is the greatest need for volunteer uh, volunteers in the park system? Well, Ken, first of all, I want to thank you for all your leadership over the years for the weed outs and basic species and just 
being a proponent of our wild spaces. Um, of our 15,300 plus acres, yeah. about 10,000 acres are actually natural areas. And those could be the Franklin Oak Savannah, but it also include, includes McGovern Park that has this beautiful woodland. And so we have to be able to maintain that. I have a very talented natural area staff, but it's a very small group. And similar to where Nature Center, we've got a great group there that uh, maintains the, the uh, surrounding area of 200 plus acres of great natural areas, but we, we need our help. So to answer your question, Ken, a few things, and one is partially gonna be answering an email you sent me the other day um, about um, can we have folks work on some more signage that uh, needs to be painted, that needs to be restored? Yes, that's something that I'd like to do more. Um, we would work with our skilled trades to make sure that we have whatever standards we need. But there's simple things like that where there's basic things we're not able to do. When I mentioned Collectivo in the box helping us redo our basketball courts, Normally, that's something we would do in house, but we don't have the staff to redo the lines, redo the backboards, things like that. So that's what we identify those projects. So I would say, with the friends groups we have existing, we have a pretty good working relationship. Whether it's friends of Esbrook, whether it's Lake Park friends, um, whether it's the you know the newly formed um, friends of Rose Park, the folks that the folks that we have established friends groups, I feel like between our staff and the volunteers and the friends, we've got a good thing going. But we only have about 40 friends groups. And so kind of to your point, if we could have a volunteer corps that we could identify projects for them to do that might you know, just be across the system, I think that would be great. Uh, we have Tony Guyron, who is our engagement manager, um, who works closely with volunteers. He works with the, the Parks Foundation. So if we could get like kind of a core group and even like uh, a trailer with all the like, you know, tools and all of that set up where we could just drop it at a location and have volunteers. I'm, I'm all for it because I, when I came to parks and I remember meeting you, I think like the first week I was on the job at that time, um, there was a lot of, I don't know, concern, I would say from folks about having volunteers in the parks. To now, like, I don't think anyone's concerned about having volunteers in the parks. Like, meaning, like, whether it's staff, whether it's like people just understand that we need to mobilize people to help us. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but there's more work that we can do. Yeah. So, it sounds almost like uh, <coughs> when people help to restore houses and that homeless. Yes. Um, I forget. Yeah. The cabbage yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's kind of, I think if we could. If we could help build some of that capacity, um, and we have you know a couple of folks in our team that are able to harness that energy of volunteers and just organize it. Dan, I'm really glad that the county um, budget includes the various things that you mentioned. But I need to ask, uh, I'm not sure how to ask the question, but there are other bigger issues. Walking County sends more money to the state than Walking County gets back. And we have a statewide election going on right now. Do you have any advice as how we as ordinary citizens can act between now and the state election? That sounds like a question for <laughs> Sheldon about the bigger picture of uh, cost sharing and revenue and relationships with the state. Shared revenue is a critical part of our budget. It's a critical part of any municipality and any community. And uh, the purpose of shared revenue was started when income tax, we were the first state in the country for income tax. Uh, it was to take from those who have and give it to those who have not. And since 1995, the $200 million shared revenue budget has not gone up for political purposes. Governors and legislatures have not wanted to share the wealth because they want to spend their spend the wealth on their own process, and it's it's terribly problematic, and that's why we're in this terrible state in the first place. Now, getting down to the real politics of it, there is one person running for governor who's been very supportive of local communities, it's very supportive of sharing revenue, very supportive of it. 
and I was very careful to say it because I, I know I can't, if I was a member of the church, I couldn't say it, but, uh, but Governor Evers has been wonderful. He's been very supportive of everything. Um, I think uh, Michael's, we, he's not had a record in politics. He has not had a record in that. Uh, but if you look at what's taking place from the gerrymandered you know, legislators right now, what with the legislature, they have not been to support it. They've taken money and they've not given it back. And sharing revenue is a promise. We, the citizens of the state of Wisconsin, were sold the constitutional amendment back in 1915 to give money from those to those who did not. And sure, it was 1915, it was 107 years ago, but you can't forget the past. If you forget the past, then you, you what's your future? So you have to remember a promise is a promise and it should be kept. So I think that, uh, I think these elections are critical. I think the governor's vote is absolutely essential in this election. Uh, and so I think voting the right way is critical. And uh, right now we don't have a legislative body that we can really, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that you know, we know who's gonna win the, the Republicans. Republicans are gonna control the assembly, the Republicans are gonna control the Senate, huge numbers, maybe even a super majority in the Senate, but the governor's race is, is really critical. So voting in any election is important. This one for the parks is gonna be critical. So thank you. It's a good point, Dan. We have an, uh, an election coming up. Uh, now is the time to talk to candidates about issues that you care about. And I'd also suggest we have down in the common room uh, some work by a Defend Democracy group that is uh, got some letter writing and postcard writing uh, going on today during uh, a coffee hour, the social hour. And they'll be there the next two uh, Sundays, uh, especially. So uh, Defend Democracy and what we're calling You, You, the Vote. Uh, here uh, to to uh, uh, for you to pay attention to in here in in October. Any other questions, Phil? Uh, yes, you alluded, Guy. You alluded to the Emerald Ant Borer and the, the Forestry Service, and there's only one herb for us. I live adjacent to Jacobus Park, and then there's like three trees in a row that are dead in an area that's kind of grassy. And it's like near where there's a supporting line to the uh, utility pole. Uh, if those trees would fall over, my car would go out again. And it's already gone out like two or three times this year because the trees falling on the power lines, which are above ground. Can you comment on them? What, are they limited to only clearing things off of paths? You know, where the dogs are walking, the people are walking, or buildings are threatened, or, you know, what's What's the sense the question of, of clearing trees with emerald that dead, 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 dead trees, trees that are will we'll fall sure. eventually? So as, as Supervisor Washburn was pointing out, we have one um, essentially arborist that oversees our landscape services area. So that includes folks that do our uh, asphalt patching, our tree work, our uh, landscape work, etc. So our, we have everything built out for, we've been removing ash trees since 2008. And unfortunately we've been removing more trees than we've been able to replace. Mm -hmm. um, but side note, we're working on that. I'll, I'll jump into that in a minute. We prioritize uh, tree removals around uh, playgrounds, parking lots, roadways, anywhere where there's people is number one. Uh, so we, we have it mapped out. We've got GIS on where we where we focus our areas. Feel free to shoot me an email uh, or a call. Let me know specifically the areas of Jacobus that I make sure that our folks are aware of those. Um, but we're, we're removing thousands of trees yearly. The good news is that um, we are, we just encumbered um, tens of thousands of dollars worth of trees that we're going to be planting in the next three years. Um, some in, in our parks, obviously, some of our tree nurseries so that we are building our stock up again with that. We also, in some cases, do contract out some of our work uh, with Davy Tree Service. Uh, we have a government contract with them as well. Um, so we try to do as much as we absolutely can. 
It's just we're very limited on our staff. But certainly feel free to let me know where that location is in Jacobus. Uh, another question uh, that occurs to me uh, in the uh, need for collaboration and partnerships, I think there might well be uh, an inclination to try to give exclusive rights or use to our county parks to whether it's ball clubs, ball groups, volleyball courts on the beach. What's the right balance uh, for collaboration and still keeping parks open as opposed to giving exclusive rights to groups, which seems pretty exclusionary? Any thoughts from either one of you on that? So we're always wanting to make sure that we have access to, to all our parks. So for example, we work with the Ability Center. Uh, to make Bradford Beach accessible with the ramp, the Moby Mads, all of that down the beach, similar to working with the Ability Center on the ice sleds that we use at Red Arrow and Wilson, as well as the beach wheelchairs and hand cycles. Uh, when it comes to little leagues or things like that, um, folks um, get permits through us uh, to do our organized sports. Uh, when they're not um, being programmed, it's, it's open um, for uh, open use, uh, free to the public. Uh, we have some leases of parkland, for example, City of Greenfield um, leases Kawiki Park, uh, but it's open to the public. They provide all the maintenance, they've um, put a new playground in, they've do, done new trails. We have uh, a couple leases with school districts uh, like Webster Park in Wauwatosa, again, open to the public. Uh, recently put a playground in there, a couple parks in Franklin School District, um, again, open to the public. Uh, we do not, we're not in the business of selling parkland. That's not what the board wants. That's not what my department wants. That's not what the county executive wants. Uh, so that's not anything that's on the table. Uh, we do have some concessionaires um, like at Bradford Beach or um, McKinley Roundhouse, which is Bartolotta's. But then we also do a lot of it in-house. So South Shore Terrace, that's my staff that's operating that. Um, the traveling beer garden, that's my staff operating that. If we were able to operate it all and I had the capacity, we absolutely would. Um, but we do try to be cognizant of that. So partnerships um, that I believe Supervisor Wasserman pointed out a little bit earlier would be the Urban Ecology Center at Washington and Riverside Parks. Uh, we have found that to be a great partnership because they're, they're able to pro provide programming open to the public for youth and adults in a way that we're not able to do currently. Another great one is the Peak Initiative at Tiefenthaler Park, where they recently did $5 million in improvements um, to that building, but they're providing uh, services to the city of Milwaukee, as well as the immediate community right around there. So it's all about that balance of the partnership, but then still having that public um, uh, access, making sure that we have the public access through those partnerships. So it is a fine balance. Um, but Journey House is another good example where we partnered with them at Mitchell Park with the Packers Field and then at Barron Park with the Ball Diamond. So, um, you know, it, it's also just making sure you have the right partner. I just want to add to, to that, you know, we take it very seriously that uh, we're not going to sell the parks. Right? We're, we're going to work with groups. But at the same time, we can't do it all by ourselves. And we also need this expertise and there's a specific group. You know, Journey House really knows their community. They know the Mitchell Park. The Teeth of the Holler uh, Park was really known by Pete. They know it better than anyone else. And it's like, you have a group that wants to support a local area and they have it open to you know, open access for everybody. Why not go for that? And I think the days of, you know, we don't have a thousand full-time members or, you know, 2000, you know, it's just huge amount where the parks can just run everything. We don't, it's the reality is that's, it's a different era now, it's a different time. You have to adapt to the changes that we have. And I think working with groups who really know parks really well is really creates more access than any decrease in access. So I think it's really valuable for all of us to work with others and uh, really make the best, best park system possible. 
Well, thank you both. I don't see any more hands. Uh, oops, one more. Let's make this the last question for Mark. Um, I don't know if you have anything to do with this, but what about the domes, future of the domes? <laughs> future of the domes. So we, so we both can talk about that. <laughs> um, so one of the things about the domes is it's a gem. We have a great partnership with the Friends of the Domes. Great leadership, both from the staff and from the board. We also have a very dedicated staff from my team that maintains it. So I have Doris Mackey and her horticulturists that do amazing work there. And then I have Blake Prusak, who's our uh, manager of our skilled trades. We have 28 uh, skilled trades folks for uh, a huge park system. Just looking at buildings alone, we have 400. At the domes itself, Blake has to have someone monitoring the uh, boiler system 24-7 a day, 24-7 uh, every day, because um, these boilers, there's four of them. County Supervisor uh, Wasserman was there on a tour the other day. One of the things that I've been doing, and we've done at least 12 tours, one-on-one -on -one tours with the county supervisors, is that you'll hear a lot about the glass, the glazing, and the metal on the domes which are family and they are single pane glass and they're not efficient. But you don't necessarily see or hear everything that goes into maintaining that facility. So I've been taking the county supervisors into the bottles of the basement where the boilers look like they're from the Titanic, um, where you see you know, the panels that control all of the HVAC, everything, it runs an XP. Windows XP, those panels don't even exist anymore. So we're grabbing PhD, which just recently closed. We're gonna be grabbing panels from there as backups. Um, and so the reality is that it is a very expensive solution. If we're gonna do anything, we need to do it all. If we don't do anything, we're gonna to have to look at how are we gonna protect that plant collection? It's a $3.2 million plant collection that's within the domes. And so it's it's one of those things where there was a conservatory that was there before, it was a glass facility that was there for about 50 years, the existing domes is about 60. So we're just having some really honest, transparent conversations with you, with the elected officials on, you know, what, what can we do there? Because I have half a billion dollars worth of deferred maintenance across the entire uh, park system. The county as a whole, I believe, has $1 billion uh, deferred maintenance. So there's a big dollar sign on it. And it's one of those things where we just, we want to talk with the public. We want to talk with their partners. We want to talk with our elected officials to figure out, are there creative funding sources to do this? Is there different ways to handle it? Um, our staff are doing an amazing job keeping things going and together, uh, but it's, it is complicated. You have an auxiliary air system, handling system, or something that you've installed that you have noticed these blowers all over. Oh, thank you for asking that question. So, one of the cool things um, during the pandemic when there was CARES dollars, we were trying to figure out how to make our spaces, especially indoor spaces, as safe as possible. So, those, those blowers we were able to buy through CARES, and it actually helps neutralize COVID and filters out um, impurities. So um, we continue to utilize those in that facility, but also in some of our rental facilities as well. We weren't able to do it everywhere, but we were trying to, we were trying to do what we could do to purify the air as best we could. So that was one of the ways we were able to do that and be able to open sooner than we had anticipated. Um, and we, we don't have capacity limits now, but we did previously. The, the board, uh, I'm going to be proposing <clears throat> some of my other colleagues uh, looking at all options available to do to what to do with the domes. Um, one option will I call it the LBJ approach uh, because uh, Lady Bird Johnson was there to dedicate the domes back in the 1960s when they see what a full repair was going to cost. Now, from everything from the bowels to the top, uh, to see what it was going to cost. And also at the other end of the spectrum, you know, what would it cost to remove it and to, to demolish the domes? And we're not saying that, you know, once again, we want all costs to be on the table and we're going to see what we can do with everything in between. We have a problem there. 
uh, a significant problem. And I think it's very telling that we don't have the corporate support. You know, the, the art museum has this huge support. You know, the, 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 the zoo, tremendous support. The domes don't have the support. And the number of visitors is staying stable. You know, there are issues there. And uh, so short, and the short answer is uh, we're going to see what's on the table. We're going to lay out all the possibilities. We're going to look at the costs. And the board's going to have to make some big decisions. We're going to have lots of input. Uh, no final decisions can be made without lots of input. And there's also a chance that you know, this is very preliminary and it's just me talking and one supervisor, but talking to some other colleagues. Uh, but we may look at a referendum, uh, a binding referendum from Milwaukee County voters today, uh, where every voter has a chance to say, do we want the domes or do we not? And if we want the don'ts, how much will it cost us, specifically on the property taxes? So uh, it's an idea that's kind of being discussed, but having the very first time of a community voting on one of their public assets, keep it or not, do you want to pay for it or not? And you're going to have the exact number right in front of you. So that may be coming up in the future. Well, thank you very much all for attending and thank you to Supervisor uh, Sheldon Wasserman and Executive Director Guy Smith for a wonderful presentation, very illuminating, uh, and we appreciate your all coming today. Thank you very much.